Thank you so much. I want to share with you my passion, which is robotic surgery. Now, what is robotic surgery? Basically, we're using a robot to, to operate, and believe it or not, there's a tie to the U.S. military and to NASA. So back in the 1980s, there was a research project at a place called SRI International in Menlo Park, California, to develop a robotic system that could operate on soldiers on the battlefield remotely, so that I could sit in New York City and operate on a patient over in Iraq or Afghanistan. NASA also funded that project because they envisioned that if uh, an astronaut went to Mars or the moon and they needed surgery, we would need to be able to do it in a remote fashion. It turned out to be absolutely worthless for that. However, a young genius by the name of Fred Mall, a general surgeon, discovered this technology and created a company around the technology, which ultimately became uh, Intuitive Surgical, which built the first multi-purpose robotic surgical system in the United States. He was sort of the Steve Jobs of robotic surgery, if you will. I've met him, and he's sort of an amazing, an amazing man. Now, in order for you to understand what significance robotic surgery has for you, and your family and people you care about, I, I need to take you into a deep dive in the changing culture of medicine. Lots of things are changing, but I want to share with you a couple of things that are related to robotic surgery. When I started my training, this was the paradigm for success in surgery. Quality and safety equals value, right? Did the patient live? Did their problem get fixed? And you know, that, and did they, did, did they have a decent experience? That was what related to the patients valuing what they went through, okay? That has changed a great deal. Now, the very first operation that I ever uh, participated in was an open gallbladder resection. Anyone in the, in the uh, audience have their gallbladder taken out? Yeah. So, uh, it used to be that we would make a big incision. You see Lyndon Johnson up there at the steps of uh, Bethesda Naval Medical Center. Big incision. That's what that first operation that I participated in in 1989 was. Now, 1989 is a very important year because that is the year that the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy was done. That's doctor speak for minimally invasive removal of the gallbladder with little ports and scopes. And it was done at a hospital called Baptist Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee by private practice doctors, yes, that is true. Probably, arguably, one of the most revolutionary advancements in surgery in the last 100 years was not done at Harvard, was not done at University of Pennsylvania where I trained, or Jefferson, it was actually done at a private practice hospital. And there's a lot of deeper meaning to that story. Well, when I scrubbed in on that open gallbladder, the surgeon turned to me and said, Sloan guy, you know, you're a young medical student. I just want you to know that this big incision is the way to take this gallbladder out. It's safer. There are these charlatans over at this other hospital in Nashville that are taking out the gallbladder through little incisions. They are to be condemned. They are really guilty of war crimes, in my opinion. They should be perhaps even arrested for the terrible things that they're doing. We've seen complications of that procedure, and they're just totally wrong to do so. Now, by the end of my training the entire paradigm had shifted, and it was virtually negligent to not take out the gallbladder minimally invasively as of 2002 when I finished general surgery, and certainly 2004 when I finished my cardiothoracic surgery training. And that's because a revolution took place where what the patient wanted became important. And this was not brought about by the medical establishment. In fact, at the American College of Surgeons meeting, which, by the way, is going on right now, um, at the American College of Surgeons meeting in 1989, the first report of the laparoscopic cholecystectomy came out, and it was widely condemned by the medical establishment. One year later, 50,000 of those procedures had been performed. And today, it's, it's virtually the standard of care. And the reason being is that now the patient experience matters, the lack of cost, and the early recovery created by lack of invasiveness matters to patients. So the patient started to have a vote for the first time. Now, this is not the traditional pass for uh, medicine. This is, you know, when we want to give you when, you, when we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. And there's still doctors like that. I'm sure you, you may have run into them, but it's really a profound mistake because at the end of the day, it's not doctors that are important, it's the patients that we uh, that we serve. But the medical establishment has been very resistant. Now, resisting new technology is nothing new, and there are some good reasons for it. You know, no one wants to be selling snake oil that's not really going to benefit patients, or worse yet, hurt patients. But, you know, there's some famous statements about things that are now routine. 
like Dr. Bill Roth, who was a famous surgeon back in his day, back in the 1880s, essentially saying that only a fool would operate on the heart. And today, we do it all the time without difficulty. History is replete with this. Now, traditional heart surgery is done by taking a saw. It's kind of scary looking. It's essentially a band saw, and we saw the sternum or the breastplate open and put a retractor in, and we make a big incision. And the people who trained me in the very beginning said the bigger incision, the better. Bigger incision equals quality and equals safety. And, you know, I started to notice some things coming out of my training uh, in general surgery where we were doing a lot more minimally invasive surgery. It just seemed the incision was even bigger than was necessary. And why, why were we making it so big? Well, it's because that generation believed that's what was safe. Studies have looked at outcomes in sternotomy surgery, and most cardiac surgeons that do only sternotomies will tell you that it's no big deal, that, sur that patients do well, and they'll show some anecdote of some 40-year-old person that did great. But the reality is that studies show that about half the patients still have significant discomfort at a year. Sternotomy is a big incision. And cardiac surgery has lagged behind general surgery and other specialties in embracing minimally invasive, in part because it is more risky and we've got to be safer. Now, disruption is nothing new to everyone in this room, right? And my favorite disruptor was Uber, right? Because Uber, I mean, I used Uber to get to this talk from the train station, right? It's great. You, you hit a button and somebody shows up and takes you where you need to go. It's a lot more convenient than what we used in the past. But of course, that was a problem for taxi cab drivers. Certainly in New York City, it was a big deal where the taxi medallion they have to buy was very expensive. It was very, very disruptive uh, technology. Robotics is very similar to that. It threatens other people and the way they do, uh, do what they do, but it has benefit to patients. And so there's a little bit of an internal conflict there. Now, most of you are not in the medical field, so I'll tell you a little bit about what robotics is. Essentially, you sit at a console, and you really do what's called teleoperation. You operate what to you would look almost like a game console. The instruments are placed into the patient, and you're able to manipulate those instruments as if they were your hand. That's really all robotics is. Now, the first generation was very clumsy, and you had to use a screwdriver to connect things, and it was just not the greatest machine. But just like the cell phone has evolved, the robotic systems have, have evolved. This is what a modern robotic heart operation looks, at, looks like. This is one of my patients. This is a robotic mitral valve repair. And basically, there's four sort of pencil-sized ports that we put in there and one 12-millimeter port, and that's it. There's no other open incisions in the body. Of course, the patient's on the heart-lung machine, so we uh, have bypass cannulas, which we put in percutaneously. But it's, it's very similar to a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And I will tell you, it's very foreign to most cardiac surgeons who've not embraced it. This is what the incisions look like. These actually aren't even the best ones I could show, but you know, they're basically very small ports. And the reason the patients recover more quickly is you're not spreading the ribs, you're not cracking bone or sawing bone, you're sort of slipping in between the ribs. Now, intuitive surgical has sort of had a, somewhat of a monopoly over this field for many years. And um, now there's a revolution of new companies coming out. How many people here knew, for instance, that Google was actually building a surgical robotic system? I bet not many. So on the, on the campus of Google in California, they're actually building a surgical robotic system with Johnson Johnson called Verb Surgical. There are others, um, Transenteric, Medtronic, Cambridge Medical in uh, the UK. We're sort of seeing an explosion of robotic systems that are coming out, in part because robotics is being embraced by our society at large. And I think we'll see more and more robotics, not only in healthcare, but other fields. But today, we really only have one good system. I think in five or 10 years, we may have as many as 10 systems. And of course, that will benefit you know, patients. Now, believe it or not, this is actual robotic mitral valve surgery not that long ago, a few months ago. And this is me operating on the inside of the uh, human heart. Now, what you're seeing there is sort of a low-definition 2D view. But what I see when I operate is a 3D high-definition view. And uh, we, don't, we don't have tactile feedback, although it turns out you don't really need much of that. And you can do just sort of extraordinary things. That's the mitral valve that I'm operating on. I'm repairing it by putting these things called neocords, which are sort of like parachute cords uh, to fix the valve. And this is sort of a standard repair. It's not that different than what I would do if I were doing an open sternotomy. 
but actually once I get to the valve, it's, it's quite easy. And this is being done just with those little incisions that I, uh, that I showed you. Now I want to talk a little bit about teamwork. So the first big cultural change in medicine was a shift away from what was important to doctors to what was important to patients, right? You got that. The second big shift is a shift away from the surgeon as the boss to the surgeon as a member of the team, more of a coach or a facilitator, if you will. And the saying that I like to say is the era of the sort of rock star surgeon is over and sort of the rock band is upon us. The whole team really is important. Now, I also played college football, and I will tell you that uh, teamwork is very important in football. If, if one guy thinks they should do a running play and the other guy's going out for a pass and the other guy, you know, doesn't even know the play has started, you know, that's a problem. Teamwork is very important. And you do have to have a leader and a facilitator, and that's still, I think, the surgeon, but you've got to have everyone else uh, really skilled, communicating well, and more than anything, cooperating. It's quite difficult to do these days. This is my team. If you look at the top right-hand uh, corner there, that's my team at uh, Jefferson in Philadelphia. Uh, they are quite uh, comical individuals <laughs> who, who have a great sense of humor, which benefits us when we're uh, doing procedures. And that a uh, cool picture of the uh, surgical robot was drawn by uh, one of our nurses who's a, who's a great artist. But the point is, I cannot do this without a team. And a lot of people in business, military, uh, sports, they give a lot of lip service to, to teamwork. In robotics, you can't give lip service to it. You actually have to be a team player to do robotics. Not just me, but every member of the team. It's just not possible without the team. So when I uh, moved, actually I moved from New York to Philadelphia recently, it took me about three months to get the team in Philadelphia ready to you know, do a case in a way that I would feel comfortable. Now, where did I learn teamwork? Well, this is one of the places that I learned teamwork. This is a Ford operating base in uh, northeastern uh, Afghanistan, one of the three tours that I did. And we basically dropped into this place, and within about a week, we had to uh, essentially have a fully functioning trauma center with folks that we didn't even know. We'd never met them before. We had to learn each other's personalities. We had to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses, uh, technical skills, etc., and prepare to take care of American soldiers that were injured and do so effectively. I really learned how to build teams in Iraq and Afghanistan. Certainly, I learned a lot playing football, but this, this was really a, uh, uh, a very important part of, of how I evolved. Now, it's interesting because I've been criticized by members of the medical community that, you know, Sloan, this is not the military. You can't just boss people around. But the truth is that military culture is actually far more collaborative than most civilian medical institutions, which are often quite top-down. Uh, my standard joke is that an infantry leader in Fallujah is probably more collaborative than your average you know, hospital leader. And I think that's largely true. And the other thing that's different about the military is they actually treat le they teach leadership. So in medicine, you may not know this, but they'll put a doctor in charge that's never run a lemonade stand. Not so in the military. And so that, that background has really uh, served me well. And I don't think that I could do what I'd do today without it. And interestingly enough, if you look back at the history of cardiac surgery, most of the leaders in cardiac surgery that sort of started the profession actually were surgeons returning from World War II. They learned how to lead. They learned teamwork. But they also didn't have old people over there telling them that they couldn't do it. So they came back and said, we can do heart surgery, we can figure this out, and they did figure it out. And I think my, my career has been very similar to that. that when, when, when you have done, as a cardiac surgeon and a general surgeon, when you've done a craniotomy in Afghanistan, that's right, brain surgery, because there was no neurosurgeon available, it's hard to get too intimidated by doing something like a robotic mitral valve uh, procedure and to build teams around that. And, you know, <clears throat> um, there's a lot of quotes like this, you know, I could either uh, watch it happen or be part of it. I don't think I really ever had a choice when it came to in innovation in robotics. I've always felt driven towards it, and I'm still driven towards what the next iteration of robotic surgery is. For me, it was to eliminate the open incisions, to go to just the small incisions, eliminate the need to cut down on arteries and veins for going on bypass and do it percutaneously. That was the last iteration. I'm not sure what the next iteration will be, but I want to get less and less invasive. And 
I think to close out, I just want to say that when you're talking about health care, you cannot forget that it's about the patient. It's not about the doctors. It's not about the nurses. It's not about the administrators or the other staff. It's about the patients. And this was one of my patients who sent me this picture after a robotic mitral valve skiing in three weeks. There is benefit to it. And to tell, you know, um, a little bit of a personal story, a close um, relative of mine underwent uh, surgery using the robot for um, gynecologic con uh, condition. And, um, you know, uh, basically she was out of the hospital in a day and was back home in about um, 24 hours and was able to drive in about four days. Now, that would not be possible without the robot. And that makes a big difference. Doctors in the past didn't really care how long it took you to recover. Now they do because now they're listening to patients. And you're going to see more and more of this. So thank you very much. <laughs> mm.